You're live, sir. All right, guys, we are going to be starting our T session number seven on RAM. So hopefully you'll be learning a lot. And let's get started. So our objectives are going to be to define system memory and describe the different technologies. We're going to articulate the process, including key questions to, to answer when upgrading memory. We are going to determine how to select and purchase the right memory module. We will summarize the process of installing memory. We will identify common pitfalls when selecting or installing that memory and identify common problems that come up with memory and describe how to solve them. All right, and some key BSMs. Uh, you need to be adaptable because uh, it's super important to take into account that when things aren't super clear, you need to be able to work on the fly. Uh, there might be times where you're working uh, on a motherboard and you don't have the right RAM module on hand. So you have to be able to quickly figure out what you need uh, to upgrade that RAM or replace it, whatever we need. And we also need to be persistent. The RAM can be difficult at times, especially uh, learning all the basics of it. So we need to stay persistent and keep an open mind. All right, some key terms for memory. Be a good idea to write these down so that way you will know what they are. So volatile memory, this is memory that loses its contents when the power is turned off. So if the power goes off, it doesn't store that memory anywhere, anywhere it's just gone. I'm gonna open up the chat. We also have non-volatile memory and this memory retains its contents when power is turned off. So if the power goes off, you still have that memory. We also have unbuffered memory, and that deals directly with the chipset controller, which we will go into more detail in a bit. And then we also have buffered memory, which contains a buffer to help the chipset handle a large electrical load if the system has a lot of memory. So this helps it from being overloaded, but that will make it a little slower, whereas unbuffered just goes directly through. And then we have our single-sided and double-sided RAMs. So single-sided, has chips only on one side of the stick, whereas double side will have chips on both sides of the stick. And we'll be showing pictures of it in a little, a little bit. harder to tell nowadays because more often than not, they will have the RAM fully enclosed now. Yeah. But almost all of them are double sided RAM at this point. Yeah, a lot of RAM modules will have like a covering over it to make it look nicer. Sometimes they'll have RGB, looks really pretty, but doesn't really do anything. Kind of like graphics cards as well. Like they're fully encased now where you can't see everything on them. Yeah. You just have the uh, vent holes for the fan. Before I took this class, I thought all RAM was enclosed because that's how my RAM is. And then I learned <laughs> that most RAM isn't. They have the little chips on the side. And they look a lot less nice. What do we got to be careful not to do with those chips? Touch them. Spill water on them. That's a bonus. Water and electronics, no bueno. You don't want your dog to 
chew on them either. There are a lot that, of things that you don't want to happen to those chips. Yes. Well, when handling the chips, you don't want to touch them. All right. Give me a thumbs up once you have written down our little key terms. That way I know I can move on. We will also be posting the Nearpod in the Slack if we haven't done that already. Come on now. All right. So I'm going to move ahead. All right. So our definition of memory. So it's an area within a computer where information is stored while being worked on. And information is stored by using on or off switches where on is going to equal one and off will equal zero. And when strung together, these switches can represent large numbers and code values. So that's where our binary comes into play. We really see long strands of zero, zero, one, one, zeros. And it tells the, the computer to do anything and everything. So with a raise of your hand, who thinks they can tell me the difference between memory and storage? Um, memory is not oh, I'm permanent. Sorry, sorry, I got to cut you off. Justin uh, raised his hand. Oh, man. Everybody for that. Um, uh, so basically, the the storage deals directly with the hard drive, and memory uh, it deals directly with the RAM. But the memory is uh, basically it could be uh, is it could be volatile or non volatile. Like it could be deleted or deleted. Storage is is directly on the hard drive, so the PC cut off is still gonna be there once you cut it back on. Yeah, good. For Mario, you want to add to that? Uh, isn't um, memory more so um, short term, whereas storage is long, longer term? Right. It's also a lot faster. Luis, do you want to raise your hand and then I, you can add to what we have to say? Um. Yeah, memory has to do with RAM. Storage <laughs> has to do with hard drive, SSD ports, stuff like that. All right, so now we're moving on to read-only memory, also known as ROM. So it's non-volatile and permanent. It cannot change instructions unless it's replaced. So this stores our system information, like our post routine, our BIOS programs, boot instructions, Uh, so ROM chips, there are programmable, programmable ROM, also known as PROM or PROM, erasable programmable ROM, EPROM, and then electrically erasable programmable ROM, EEE PROM. Seeing lots of faces, taking notes. That's what I like to see. Seeing a lot of faces that are screen because their cameras are off. Like to see those faces. There's Janina. <laughs> Right, give me a thumbs up once you have taken your notes.
Do you have a question, Justin, or you still got your hand up? Cool, cool. Yes, Ash, Kelly posted the student paste Nearpod just above, so you can go back and look through it. All right, I'm going to move ahead. We're going to try to get through this a little faster than we did with motherboard. You can always go back if you need to see. All right, so now we're into RAM, our random access memory. So we have dynamic RAM or DRAM, and that stores data for only a fraction of a second before losing it. And to maintain stored data, the system must constantly refresh that DRAM. This reduces the performance, but it is packaged as a SIMS, which is single inline memory modules, or DIMS, dual inline memory modules. You don't have to write every single part of this, just those key points. DRAM stores it for a fraction of a second before losing it. That's pretty big. Uh, knowing sims and dims, that's pretty good to know. Static RAM or SRAM. This retains information without the need for refreshing as long as the computer's power is on. So that makes it volatile. So Kelly, will you pick a random student? Yes. <clears throat> Ash, actually. Ash, can you tell me the difference between volatile and non-volatile memory? I seem to have forgotten. Volatile memory is like it will lose uh, the mem. Once you power turn off the power, uh, uh, we will lose the data, but mm -hmm. non-volatile means uh, once you turn off the power, we still have that, uh, you know, the data in it. That is nice. exactly correct. Yeah, perfect explanation. Thank you. Thank you for jogging my memory. My apparently volatile memory. All right, so we also have our CMOS RAM. And this is memory that is used, that uses a small battery to keep its volatile state always retained. It stores almost all motherboard configuration data. So that CMOS battery, when you turn the computer off, the RAM is being activated by that CMOS battery. So as long as there's a charge in the CMOS battery, uh, it's holding its memory. But when that uh, battery dies, it'll lose its memory, and so you'll have to uh, reset that data that you you configured earlier, and then also have to replace that battery. Right. And we have synchronous DRAM or synchronous dynamic RAM, and it is designed to operate at clock speed. So if the system bus is 100 megahertz, the SD RAM matches that frequency. So it will always match the frequency of the system bus. And it'll be referred to with a PC XXX. The Xs represent like the number, the bus speed, and we'll be able to see a better example of that in just a second. But it'll say PC and then some numbers. All right, 
So an overview of SDRAM. So it's used in most modern systems and is RAM that holds instructions and data used by the CPU. They connect through the North Bridge and the memory controller chip, also known as the MCC. And it is tied to the system clock like the CPU and MCC so that the result is a little waste of time. So it's always activating on a beat. So wherever the uh, system clock is at, every time it makes a rotation or it light goes through and it vibrates, it's always going to, uh, something is always happening on that beat. All right, so different form factors for memory slots or banks. We have DIM, which is dual inline module. That's gonna be for PCs. So this longer one, that's what you're going to see within your desktop. We also have SODIMs, which are small outline DIMs, and those are used in laptops. So if you see a small stick of RAM, that's for laptops, not for desktops. And there will be lots of test questions where it'll ask like what kind of RAM you should be using. And it'll almost always have like a so dim, a dim, it'll say like DDR or something. But we'll get to that in just a little bit. And then we also have micro dims and those are used in sub notebooks. So really small laptops. This is an example right here. It's very small. And they you can see that all these RAM stick or modules, they have uh, chips on the side, and they have to pack it super tightly on the micro DIM. All right, Kelly, can you pick a student for me? Let's see, we have a uh, Tajma. Tajma, what kind of RAM will you use in a laptop? Give me a second. Are you good? If you would like to phone a friend. Um, yeah, I think I need to. Okay. Looks like you have two friends that are raising their hand. Three friends. Dominique. Four friends. He's first. <laughs> is it a SODEM? It is a SODEM. Very good. SODEMs are the, I guess, medium of the three that we talked about. Those are used for laptops. Romario, can you tell me what we're going to use for a, a desktop? Uh, D I M M. Dim. Uh, dim. Dim. Yeah, nice. And Brittany, what will we use for our notebooks? Um, a micro dim. Yep. Awesome. Good job, guys. All right. Now we get to talk about the fun stuff. All the math. So your digitizer. <laughs> I did I have my digitizer. I can probably hook it up. <laughs> Take like two seconds. All right. So DDR, which is double data rate SD RAM. So when we get into the DDRs, we're talking about more modern RAM. Uh, DDR is the least modern of the 
modern RAMs, it being the first. So DDR doubles the amount of data transferred per clock cycle, and it effectively doubles the bandwidth of the memory. And so when I say double, uh, doubles the data transfer per clock cycle. So if you think of a clock as being a little circle, right? We know what a clock is. So every time the clock goes by and reaches that top, that's one cycle. And so normally something only happens once per clock cycle. So if you imagine it's always happening at 12 o'clock, when it goes through the cycle and hits that 12, the, it's able to do uh, some sort of like calculation. So every time it hits that cycle, the computer is doing something. And it happens very fast. So it's not, you know, very, it's not as slow as, you know, just a circle, but Thousands it's always happening. Millions of times a second. Yeah, like it's it's insanely fast, but every time it hits that that point, that's when something is done. They're not uh, because the 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 clock is so precise. Everything can sync up within the computer at that point. And so now that we have DDR, it doubles the the amount of times that we can do something. So at the start of their clock, it'll happen. And then about halfway, it'll do something. And then at that 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock. And it, every time we hit that 12 and 6, another action is happening. So something that'll be super important. Let's annotate. We'll do orange. You need to know the 10 connections. So for dim, it's 184 pins. For so dim, it's 200 pins. And for micro dims, it's 172. Yes, you do need to know this. You do need to know this. I made the mistake of not uh, learning this early. And then when I had to start taking my practice exams, I did not know this. And so I had to go back to it um, because you'll need to know the pin counts for DDR uh, one through four. Some of them are the same, some are different, but separate it into, so DDR for DIM is gonna be 184, DDR for SODIM 200, and DDR for micro DIM 172. All right. So this allows our dual channel technology using two DDR SD RAM sticks together to increase that in throughput. And then a PC rating is a measure of the total bandwidth in megabytes per second. So now we have to do a little bit of math. And yes, this is on the exam. There typically isn't a lot of it on the exam, but it's a free point if you know how to do it. So our clock speed is over here. We have 100 megahertz, 133 megahertz, 166, and 200. Okay. So our DDR speed, we know that DDR stands for what Tajma? Um, double data RAM. Double data rate, but oh, sorry, you're you're on the right you're on the right track. Um, so good job with that. So we know that it's double the data rate, so it's going to be double the clock speed. So when we see this DDR speed rating, we know it's going to be double whatever our clock speed is. So our clock speed times two is going to equal our DDR-200, DDR-266, 333, 400, approximately. You know, the 166 is obviously going to be a little bit off. 
Um, and then we get to speed rate, the PC speed rating, which is, uh, let's see if anyone can figure it out themselves. Uh, who can tell me where we get this PC speed rating? I'll give you a hint, it's multiplication. Umberto. Yes, uh, you multiply the DDR speed rating mm -hmm. by eight, because in each cycle, you are, you are moving eight bytes at a time. Yeah, exactly, or bits at a time, I think. 64 but, bits is the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so we're moving, uh, we're multiplying by eight to get this PC speed rating. Our 200 times eight is gonna get us 1600. Uh, the 266 is gonna get us around 2100. Uh, 333 is gonna get us to that 2700. And the 400 is gonna get us to 3200. And don't stress out about it not equaling exactly the PC rate. All, you're going to be tested uh, by multiple choice anyway. So you'll be able to, there, it'll be clearly like this is the answer. Because you know that 266 isn't going to be 1600. It's not close to 2700, 3200. So it would have to be the 2100. All right. So dual we, channel tech. Oh, go sorry, ahead, do Kelly. We, do we? I'm just checking faces here. Do we need another example of that? There will be more examples. Okay. But if you need more examples, we can give it to you now. Well, I'm asking. I'm asking the gallery. Oh, yeah, well, I guess. Mm -hmm. question. <laughs> if you would like another example. Yes. Of yes. This. Okay. So. Is it this? No. Oh. Uh, draw. That's what I need. All right. So. If our clock speed is 300 megahertz, to find our DDR speed rating, we're going to multiply by 2 because it's double the data rate. So 300 times 2 is going to get us 600. And this DDR just tells us what generation it is. So DDR 600. It's basically a DDR1, technically. Yeah. So if it's asking you, uh, well, we'll get, we'll get into that later because it, it'll show up. So to get our PC speed rating, we're going to multiply this number by 8. So I'm bad at math. So who can tell me? what 600 times eight is. You can type it in the chat if you'd like. 48, 4800. That looks good. All right, so our PC speed rating would be 4800. Makes sense, give me thumb, some thumbs up. So will it always be multiplying by eight? Yes, for the PC speed rating, it'll always be by eight. So you go from clock speed to your DDR speed to your PC speed. So and you'll 
we will get into the DDR generations as well, because that changes some of the calculation, but to get your PC speed rating, you're always multiplying your DDR rate by eight. Yeah. All right, so dual channel technology. This is the use of two DDR SD RAM sticks together to increase that throughput. Uh, this technology depends on the motherboard. So older motherboards might not necessarily have this. And uh, two identical memories are required in paired slots of the same color. So if you notice here, it's red, black, red, black. The reds would go together and the blacks would go together. And over here, we have orange and yellow, orange and yellow. Oranges go together, yellows go together. And so what that does, it basically lets the RAM act as larger RAM. So instead of having just like eight gigs of RAM, it acts as if you had 16, gam 16 gigs of RAM working as one. And they're almost always color coded unless you have like a fancy motherboard that is designed for aesthetics, then it might be all be black, red, or whatever color that you're wanting it to be. So now DDR2, a little bit more math. So this is faster than DDR while using less power. So anytime we go up a generation is almost, it's always going to double in efficiency and it is always gonna use less power. So the speed increase comes by the clock doubling the input output circuits, the IO circuits on the chips. Uh, it doesn't speed up the core RAM for data, but it does for the IO circuits. So DDR2 is going to use a 240 pin connector. Do I not have draw? It's going to use a 240 pin connector and is not compatible with DDR. DDR2 so dim is going to be 200. We don't have one for micro, so don't worry about that. But you do need to know the difference between the regular DIM and the SODIM. So DDR RAM is not going to fit in the same spots that DDR2 RAM will fit in, and vice versa. But we sh we'll show you different examples of that later. And motherboards will run both single channel and dual channel for DDR2. All right, Kaylin, how do we find our DDR speed based off of our core clock speed? Um, you multiply by the speed. Um. Yeah, you multiply the speed by eight, right? We're going from the clock speed to the DDR speed first. Because we have to go from clock to DDR to PC speed. Oh. What does DDR mean? Double data. Right. So what do you think we're going to do? from the core clock speed to the DDR, if it's double data. Add it. No. Multiply mm -hmm. by? Two. Two, yeah, we're doubling it. It's in the name. So we're going to multiply by two. So our 100 megahertz 
is going to double to 200 megahertz for our DDR input output speed. But now that we're working with DDR2, our, our speeds are doubling once again. So we're going to double our DDR speed to figure out what our DDR2 speed is. So 200 times 2 is going to be 400. So DDR2 is going to run at 400. And then to find that PC speed rating, Luis, what are we going to multiply by? By 8. By 8. Well done. So whenever we're going from our DDR to PC speed rating, it's always going to be 8. But when we're going up our generations of DDR, it's going to be by 2. So 400 times 8 is going to be that 3,200. And you will notice that it'll say PC2-3200. So if all you see is PC2-3200, you know that it's going to be DDR2 because it'll have that 2 there. If it's DDR1, it'll just say PC. If it's DDR3, it'll say PC3, DDR4, PC4. Makes sense. Kelly, will you call on a random student for me? Absolutely. Chris K. Chris K. Will you tell me what our DDR speed is going to be for 300 megahertz? For 300 megahertz? Mm -hmm. um, 600. 600? Why is it going to be 600? Multiplying by two. Why are we multiplying by two? Because it's double data rate. Right. And Chris, if we want to see what our DDR2 speed rating is going to be, what are we going to do this time? Multiply by eight. By eight? Oh, no. Two again. I'm sorry. Yeah, there we go. You got it. And so what's our DDR2 rate going to be? Um, 1,200. Yep. And so now are we going to multiply by 8? Yeah. And I'll let you pick on somebody to tell us what our PC speed rating is. Make them do some math on the fly. Uh, Ash seems so. All right. Uh, is it going to be uh, 12,000 multiplied by eight? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 9,600. 9,600, well done. And you did that in your head. I still write it out. So our PC2 rating is going to be 9,600. Any questions, concerns? All right, I'm going to take that as a no. And we will move on. Oh, Humberto. Yes, sir. Yes, I think that the, the, the speed in the DDR input output are in megahertz. Yes, the, they are the megahertz. Are also when we multiply by two to find the DDR2 speed ratings are still megahertz, isn't it? Yes, they are. And then, so and then, then we multiply by eight because there are eight bytes per transaction of mm -hmm. the system. And yes. we go to bytes per second, I believe, the speed rating. Yes. Just to make sure. Yes, sir. <clears throat> All right. 
Let me clear the. All right, so now we are on DDR3. So how much more efficient do we think it's going to be? Two times. Two times. Yes, thank you, Humberto. It's going to be twice as effective as DDR2, and it's going to use around 30% lower power consumption. So we're getting faster and also using less resources. So everything's becoming more and more efficient. So it doubles the buffer from 4 bits to 8 bits, giving it a huge bandwidth over our older RAM. And we need to know that it is a 240 pin slot for the uh, our regular DIM and it is 204 pins for SODIM. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step in and give a little interjection here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understand this is about this is about the only math in the whole thing. The whole thing isn't going to be making calculations and stuff like this. This is about the vast majority of the math is in this one technical session, just so you're yeah. aware. Yeah. You got to learn how to add by hand before you can use that calculator. So we're just showing you how we're getting that speed rating because we want you to know what it means to for PC3 6400 versus, uh, you know, PC2 6400. Right. DR3 supports triple channel and quad channel architectures. So instead of having just two slots available or even one, you can use up to three for triple channel. Well, using three for triple channel or using four for the quad channel architecture. All right. Kelly, will you pick on a student for me? Sure, pick on people all the time. Yeah. Dominic. All right. Dominic, how are we getting our DDR2 speed here? We multiply so, by two. What are we multiplying by two? The core RAM clock speed. So if we multiply the core RAM clock speed by two, it's 100 megahertz times two. We're going to get 200 megahertz. And then you multiply by two again. Why are we multiplying by two again? Because it's DDR2, mm -hmm. so it's uh, what exactly is it? data rate two. Yep. So the this 200 megahertz, that's our DDR1 speeds. Mm -hmm. uh, to get our DDR2, we got to multiply that number by, two, which got us that 400. And what are we gonna do to get our DDR3 speed rating? You multiply it by two again since so it's three, so you gotta multiply it three times. Right. You can skip all this by if you know that DDR, you have a DDR3 uh, RAM module and you know that your RAM's clock speed is 100 megahertz, you can multiply it by two three times or you could multiply it by six yeah. to skip that process. Oh, wait, by eight, actually, because two times two is going to be four, and then four times two, because it's doubling in speed every time. So you'd actually multiply by eight. Or you could think of it as two to the power of three, which is eight. Just a little math lesson. All right, so we have our 800 DDR3 speed. How are you going to find this PC speed rating? Multiply by eight. Yep. We're always 
just going to multiply by 8 to get that PC speed rating. So 800 times 8 is going to be 6,400. So Kelly, will you call on a student for me? Uh, Marisha Sims. Marisha. Are you available? Hi, I'm here, but I just walked away from oh, my yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. That's okay. I just walked away from my computer. That's okay. Can you see what we're doing now or? No, I can't Here. see it. Okay, then just listen in and I got you. We'll, we'll get someone else. Kelly? Kaylin. Kaylin. Do you see this number right yeah. here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what kind of RAM is going to use that PC speed rating? Oh, um, damn. Maybe. It's a DDR type of RAM. What generation do you think it's going to be? Um, six, 6400. Oh, um, I don't know. Do you want to phone a friend? Sure. All right. You got a few people raising their hand. Um, Jimmy. DDR3 generation. The one that I wrote. Oh, which one did you write? Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that. Oh, you're good. So what do you think this one's going to be? What it's generation? Just... Yeah, it wouldn't be DDR3. Nope. One second. There you go. I didn't see the one you wrote. Oh, that would be. Yeah, I thought it was DDR3, my bad. There you go. All right, Alan, why don't you help us out? I think it'd be the first generation because if it was a third generation and have a three to it. Okay. So, what do you think it would look like? If it was second oh, it'd generation. be a 400 megahertz. Well, I'm just asking what generation you think it would be. Oh, uh, DDR1. Okay. What do you, what would a DDR2 uh, uh, PC was, speed rating? What was that? What would a DDR2 PC speed rating look like if it was the same number? 6400. Uh, 6400, the DDR2 speed. <sighs> Would it be 400 Not for the quite. speed? I, th I think you're getting confused on how I'm asking the question. Would it have the no, PC2 on it? PC2, yeah. yes. Thank you, Kayla. Oh, yes. Gotcha. I was Just a confused. Yeah, it's, I think I asked it kind of weirdly. So because it says PC, just PC, we know that it is a DDR generation one. If it says PC2, it's generation two. PC3, generation three. So that number beside our PC is going to tell us what generation it is. But Alan, you are getting in the right headspace because if we know that this is PC 6400 and we want to know the RAM's clock speed, we have to work backwards, right? So. PC 6400 is going to look a lot different than PC2 6400. Because our clock speed, well, so first we have to go to our DDR. So we need to divide by 8. So that's going to be 800. And then because we have our DDR rate, we're going to divide by 2 to get our clock speed. So 800 divided by 2 is going to be 400. Versus 6400 for PC2, 
we're going to have to divide by eight and get 800 for DDR2. Then we have to go to our DDR. So we're going to divide by two from there to get us 400. DDR probably should have picked a different color. But then to get to our clock speed from there, we have to divide by two again, which would put us at 200 megahertz. So it's a big difference between 400 and 200. So it's important to be able to tell what generation we're in. Any questions, concerns? Yes, Justin. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I'm sorry, was somebody else talking? Okay, I, I was with you up until the point when we started talking about the PC generation mm -hmm. and, and how that is applicable to the, the DDR rates. Okay. I, I'm not like connecting the dots on how the generation of the PC. Like what does that really have to do with it's it? It's not the generation of the PC, it's the generation of the RAM. Mm -hmm. When it says PC3, that tells you the generation of the RAM. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, so PC3 equals generation three. So that'd be DDR3. So if it was PC2, it'd be DDR2. Exactly. Okay. I got you. Okay, I, I wasn't connecting the dots on that. That's all right. I'm glad you asked so that way we could clarify. All right, Renzi? Yes, um, Avery, can you do another example like you did the one that you just did to correct me out? I need to get used to how you're asking the questions differently so that I can follow. You know what I'm saying? It's how I, I understand how you came up with the numbers, but I just mm -hmm. want to, I feel like the way you're asking the questions is a little different, and I want to understand if I can answer the question correctly. That's like I wasn't following. Oh, you're you're good. You guys also have to recognize this, you know, I, I'm still learning to to cheat, teach you guys in the best possible way that I can. So asking clarifying questions is super helpful for you guys and myself. So don't don't ever feel like you can't ask to do it. So Renzi, you're gonna do this example. <laughs> so let's do here, we'll, we'll, we'll do 400 as our RAM clock speed, OK? So our starting clock speed is 400 megahertz, all right? So we want to find our PC speed rating for a generation 3 DDR, so DDR3. So first, we need to get to our DDR speed rating, right? Mm -hmm. So how are we going to find that? We're going to divide? No, no, we multiply. We multiply. So we're going to multiply by 2, which is going to get us 800 megahertz for our DDR speed. Now we have to find our DDR2. Right. Because every time we're just doubling our efficiency. So 800 times 2 is going to be 1600 megahertz. And now we can finally find our DDR3 speed. Mm -hmm. Because we're doubling our efficiency, and that's going to put us at 3,200 megahertz. All right, so now we can find our PC speed rating. So what are we going to multiply? By eight. So I don't want to do this in my head and embarrass myself, so we're going to draw it out. 8 times 0 is 0, 8 times 0 is 0, 8 times 2 16, 
And eight times three is 24 plus one, 25. So our PC speed rating is going to be 25,600 megahertz. And that's the process. All right, any questions before we move on? Thank you. All right. And then finally, we have DDR4, which once again is doubling in efficiency and it's uh, using less voltage than DDR3. So, in theory, there can be 512 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM in your system. You will never need that much. Um, max, and this, this very max, you're probably only ever going to need 32. But you can, in theory, reach 512. So it runs at 1.2 volts, and it uses a 288-pin connector and uh or the module has 288 pins is not backwards compatible and this is for your dim i don't think we have a so dim yet you have to remember that the a plus is a little bit of an older exam so this like the furthest it got when they wrote the exam so you need to know that it's 288 pin for a DIM module. So like we did before, it's just multiplying by two, by two, by two, by two, which would be to get our DDR4, you would multiply by 16, I believe, or by eight times two. Yeah, it's by eight. By eight. Thank you guys for keeping me on my toes. Um, and then when you're going from our DDR4 to our PC speed rating, it's once again by eight. We won't do the math for this one because we've already done it a bunch of times. And how do we know that this is a generation four module? Alan, you looked like you wanted to say it. Because uh, it has a four next to the PC. Exactly. D4, it's going to be generation four. Thank you. Thank you. Umberto. I see that the bandwidth is stated in MT per second. Mm -hmm. The T stands for what? Kelly? <laughs> transactions. It's MT, microtransactions. Microtransactions. Thank you. Thanks for asking that, Umberto. Now I know. You're as well. welcome. All right. We've been going for a, a hot minute. Let's take a five minute break. Kelly, will you oh. pause the recording? Yes, you are live. All right. So we are on to our SD RAM slots. So these are the differences between our DDR. One, two, three, and four. So you'll notice that our little notches 
are in different different places to help us uh, figure out what sort of uh, RAM it is. And that way you don't put it into a wrong slot. So you cannot accidentally put a DDR slot into a DDR2, 3, or 4 slot. They will not line up. They're just DDR1 and 4 are close to each other, but they're off just enough where you cannot put it in. And Kelly, was it Ashton? I can't remember who it was that taught us the trick about the, the circles versus the squares. Do you remember that? Not off the top of my head, no. Okay. Well, so a student in our last cohort mentioned the differences between DDR1, 2, 3, and 4 with the edges. So DDR1 and 2 have these circular slots. So you're able to tell that they're older generations. So if you see these circular slots instead of the square ones, you know it's going to be 2 or 1. If you see the squares, you know that's going to be DDR3 or 4. So that's a good rule of thumb to have. Uh, DDR3 and 4 are a lot easier to tell apart because you, you can determine that it's DDR3 or 4 by the squares. And then DDR3 is going to be way more to the left. And DDR4 is going to be more to the right, but sort of centered. So that's the main difference. This is a good picture to, or a good image to either take a picture of, or uh, you can screenshot it, do whatever. I wish I would have done that earlier. That's why I'm mentioning it now. Um, but you can also notice that DDR is slightly off to the right of DDR2. So it's a little harder to tell, but there's also less pins. Any questions or concerns? You don't really need to memorize the slot positioning on the DDRs. This is mostly just kind of informing you that each generation they are in a different position and you can use the like the, the notches for quick reference. So just yeah. to kind of let you know, so you cannot insert a DDR4 into a DDR1 um, slot, it won't work. Yeah. So this is mostly just to kind of illustrate that point. Okay. Little circles are and squares are the easiest way to tell them apart, at least for those generations. Clear our drawings. I'm going to move on. All right. Latency. So latency. This is our RAM responds to electrical signals at varying rates. So a delay in a RAM's response time is called latency. So latency is referred to by one or two terms, CAS or column address stroke or CL clock cycles, cycles, clock cycles. <laughs> the lower the latency, the better. So latency is just fancy word for a delay or a slowed down response. So we know that the lower the latency, the better. So who can tell me which of these two RAM modules is going to be faster? Alan? Oh, no. You don't know? No. Nope. OK. So we know that the CAS, oh, I'm not drawing anymore. The CAS, still not drawing. There we go. Or CL is going to be how it's labeled. So if we look here, 
CL6 and CL9. That's the only two differences that we can see between these two RAM modules. So if the lower latency is better, which one do you think is going to be faster? Alan, do you want to take one. a go? What was that? The top one. The top one, right. CL6 is uh, smaller than CL9. So we know that CL6 is going to be faster. So why is one more expensive than the other? The, the one with lower latency is going to be faster. Therefore, it's going to be more expensive. So, Renzi, would you ha rather have RAM that is CL15 or CL16? I think 15, you said it would be faster. Right. The lower the number, yeah. faster it is. Good. Let's see. Evan, would you rather have RAM that is CL20 or CL5? Five. 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 Why? Because the lower the uh, latency, right? Lower the latency, the better your signal is. The faster it's going to work. The faster, that, yeah. Yeah. That's lower I mean, latency. Yeah faster it'll work. So that, that's pretty much all there is to know about latency. We don't like it, it slows things down. So the less latency we have, the better off we're going to be. Thank you, thank you. All right, so data integrity and error detection. So we are going to be introdu introducing two concepts parity and error correction coding. So parity is a method of ensuring data integrity. It has one extra bit of data to check parity. It's going to be even or odd. And the MCC uses this bit to verify if data was correct. It cannot correct the error. So. What does this mean? So if we are getting a string of data, one, zero, one, zero. Okay, let's, let's say this uh, string of data is being sent across our RAM and the MCC uh, looks at it and has to decide if this data is correct or not. Parity is going to be an additional bit of information that's sent along with our string of data that is going to signify if it is even or odd. So if it is even, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe I am right though. If this number is even, we're going to have a 1. And if the number is odd, we'll have a 0. Is that correct, Kelly? Correct, except reverse it. Um, okay. You're going to make <laughs> So the, not uh, correct. <laughs> not you're correct. Going, the, the whole point of the parity bit, from my recollection, is to make the whole chain even. So if it was you know, 1, 0, 0, 0, the parity bit would be 1, because that would make it even. I believe right, that is we'll, correct. We'll go with what Kelly has to say for now. <laughs> so right. that, that's where the, the parity bit basically will just tell you whether or not all you received is correct. Right. So if the idea is that it's going to tell you whether or not this, or if we have a zero, that means that no numbers were needed to be added to this in order to make it even. So when we say, is this even or odd, we mean if you add 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0, 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0, 
it's going to equal two, which is even. We don't need to make this number even, so we're going to have a zero there. If so the number was uh, one, one, zero, one, we would do one plus one plus zero plus one, which would equal three, which is odd. So we would need this parity bit to be one in order to make the whole thing even. Now understand that the parity bit has nothing to do with the actual data itself. All it is doing is verifying that you received what you were supposed to receive. Yep. So if we get a string of numbers, one, zero, one, zero, and the parity bit gives us one, So one plus zero, we, we already know that it's two. And if this parity bit is one, signifying that this should be odd, it'll realize, oh, there's some error. This data is not good. And it'll toss it out. You're saying if that's what shows, then you know that there's, there's a problem, right? Right. Correct. Exactly. And it's not necessarily four bits. It, we're using four bits for simplicity's sake. It could be yep. 10,000 bits. Yep. But I don't want to add up 10,000 bits to decide whether it's even or odd. So we're going to do four. All right. So if we're trying, if the, the string of data is even, the parity bit will be zero. If the string of data is odd the parity bit will be one. And that just lets the MCC know if that data is correct. Now, when we have ECC or error correction coding, it's typically used in servers, it is more robust than the parity method, and it'll detect errors by adding more information about the bits, and uh, it corrects errors on the fly. So it's slower but more expensive because it can correct it. So if we have one, zero, one, zero, it does the same thing by having that little bit that says that it's either even or odd. So if it's even, it should be zero. If it's odd, it should be one. But if there's a, something wrong with the data. So if it comes out as like break it up into fours. So if this one is missing and we get zero, one, zero, and the parity bit, well, the, the ECC bit is zero. We know that this should be even, right? So in order to make this even, our missing number has to just be a one because one plus one is gonna be two, right? Logically, there's only one possible thing that it could be. It can only be on or off, even or odd. And we know that since our extra bit is saying that this number should be even, we have to, choose the number that would make it even. But if we had the same problem, zero, one, zero, and our extra bit is one, telling us that this should be odd, then we know that the missing number would be zero to keep it odd. Now, bear in mind, please, that ECC can only correct an error in a single bit. Yep. That is the extent where it can make repairs, a single bit. If, you if a single bit gets dropped, it can fix it on the fly. If it's more than that, it's beyond the capabilities of it. But this is just a 
um, a way to kind of correct errors on the fly in servers. Yes, it is more expensive. It is not something you will ever typically see in a computer. It is typically only in enterprise settings in servers. Uh, Janina, probably not. You probably wouldn't get an error message. It would probably just fix it. If it, unless the data is completely lost, then you know, yeah, you might you get, get it. Yeah. But if it just drops a single bit and it corrects it on the fly, you would never know. Yeah. Um, how I like to think of it, the difference between parity and error correction coding. I'm assuming everyone here has been to Wendy's. Give me a thumbs up if you've been to Wendy's. I went to Wendy's for lunch today. And when I go to Wendy's, as a poor teacher that I am, I like to be smart with my money and get the four for four because it's a great deal. And so when I go to Wendy's and get my four for four, they know that I'm supposed to get my junior bacon cheeseburger, my chicken nuggets, my fries, and a drink, right? But if one of those things is missing, the cashier that's making minimum wage, they're going to see, see my, oh, that's a big box. So if I'm supposed to have my junior bacon cheeseburger, my chicken nugs, my fries, and my drink, And they know that something's missing. If I'm only getting three things, they're going to take it back, right? They're not going to know how to fix it because they're minimum wage. They don't, they, they don't get paid to think about what's missing. They're just going to send it back to the kitchen, have them fix it, right? But if a manager, our ECC, sees that, I'm using my mouse now. I think it can, you guys can tell. And uh, I'm missing something. She knows that I, I was supposed to get fries because she was paid a little more. So she knows what it's supposed to be in my four for four. So she's able to fix it on the fly, right? So she can quickly go and add my fries for that missing bit. Makes sense. So parity sends it back and says basically resend. Mm -hmm. Error correcting it corrects on the fly. But only for a single bit. Yeah. Parity will come up again, just so you know, but uh, in a different respect but we wanted to give kind of a breakdown as to what parity is for the moment. Yeah. All right, let's move on. So registered or buffered memory. So memory that has a register between it and the memory controller is gonna be registered memory. Uh, the register stores bits of information in such a way that systems can write to it or read out all the bits simultaneously. So it reduces the load on the controller, which is the, the guy that's grabbing all that information. It's less for him to grab all at once. Uh, it reduces that load and allows the device to support much more memory than would otherwise be possible. And it's used for servers. So a possible effect is an introduction of latency and a drop in performance. So uh, if you have ever watched like YouTube videos, you know that there's that gray bar and the red bar that's playing. And when that red bar catches up to that gray bar, your video stops and it has to load because it's got to buffer more of that video, right? So, but once it's buffered, it can easily play that video because it's already loaded up.
So that's what we mean by like buffered memory. It's already there. And so it's easier to access and it's less of a load on the, the MCC, which is trying to grab that data. Questions? All right. Access speed. So this is the amount of time in nanoseconds, or NS, that it takes RAM to provide the request, requested data of the memory controller. So how much time it, it takes to get that data. Uh, it ensures that add-on memory is the same speed as or faster than existing memory. So it makes sure that our added memory isn't going to be slower than what our computer can handle, or the minimum that it will handle. Uh, we do not mix memory modules with different speeds in the same bank uh, with the row of slots for adding memory. If you have uh, memory of different types, more than likely it won't work. Like it just, the computer won't uh, accept it and, and won't use it. But best case scenario, it'll only go as fast as the slowest RAM module. So there is zero benefit of having different types of RAM. Um, if you have a four gigabit uh, RAM module and an eight gig, then you might as well just use the eight gig by itself than trying to use the four and the eight. Because it probably won't work, but even if it does, it's only going to use four gigs of it. And last thing, check the motherboard specification for the required speed. So if you look at your motherboard manual, either online or what they give you, it'll tell you what kind of RAM that it can take. And that's the type of RAM you will want to use to most to get the most that you possibly can out of your system. Ajan, what will happen if we use two different types of RAM? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe speed will be slowed down. Yeah, if we're lucky, yeah. the speed will just be slower. But if we're unlucky, what will happen? Uh, if we're unlucky. Yeah, if we're unlucky. Uh, we will lose maybe some memory. Well, it data. probably just won't work. If it's not the same, it probably just won't work. The computer won't uh, get past post. But if you're lucky, it'll just uh -huh. act slower. Ah, OK, but if we're unlucky, it will just will not work at all, yeah? Right. Ah, OK. Mm -hmm. It will shut down. Mm -hmm. All right. So serial presence detect, or the SPD. So when a computer is booted, the SPD tells the basic input-output system, or BIOS, all the information about the RAM. So this is the module size, the data width, its speed and voltage. All this information is sent to your BIOS, so that way you know what kind of RAM you have. Uh, this information is stored in an electronically erasable programmable read-only memory, the EEPROM. Going back to the, our first definitions for RAM. So that just tells you what uh, information's on the RAM, how fast it is, size. Yes, Umberto. Oh, if, if we upgrade our RAM, 
we don't need to do the settings in the BIOS. It's going to be done by the serial presence detect? Not necessarily, but the majority of the time, yes. Yeah, OK. M most of the time, it'll just it'll be able to pick up what we're putting down, what we're putting in. Uh, but on rare occasions, you might have to upgrade or update your BIOS. But we don't want to do that if we can help it. Any questions on that? All right, let's move right along then. All right, when to upgrade your RAM. So main symptoms that tell you when you need more RAM are gonna be general system slowness, Windows giving you an insufficient memory error, and excessive hard drive accessing. So if you hear your hard drive going crazy, like it's just spinning super hard nonstop, it's most likely because you don't have enough RAM in your system. But in general, you're not going to need more RAM unless you're doing heavy lifting on your computer, like if you're playing games and using like uh, CAD systems, those probably need more RAM. But if you're just surfing the internet, you're just watching YouTube videos, playing solitaire, typically you'll be solid with, you know, four to eight gigs. But what the about Minesweeper with 100 blocks? Mm, I'd, I'd say four to eight is probably good for you. <laughs> But in computers that need more resources, you you know you you can go up pretty high, but you don't really need more than thirty two for any system. You won't actually be able to tell a difference past that, really, unless you're just limit testing like crazy. And you want to see if you can open up every single program you have on your computer. Right. So virtual memory, uh, our computers use a portion of the hard drive as an extension of our system RAM. And that portion in the hard drive is called a page file or a swap file. It is 1.5 times the amount of installed RAM. So when it runs out of our real RAM, our RAM modules, it's going to swap some of the programs from the RAM to the page file. So when you hear your hard drive being activated like crazy, that's it swapping to that page file and using that instead of your RAM, well, in addition to your, your RAM modules. And we don't want to do that because we or we, we don't want to do that for long because you can damage your hard drive over time if it's being accessed like crazy. Yes, Janina. So when I was reading, it was saying that um it takes some files out to store files when it's low. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so let's see the best way I can explain this. So if let's see. Okay, this is all of our RAM, all right? And we're using this for program A, this for program B, this for program C, and this for program D. If we're going to try to run program E over here, our RAM is going to try and take out what we're using the least amount of. So like if we've been using uh, B, C, and D, programs B, C, and D a bunch, and we haven't really accessed A for a little bit, it's going to swap 
A and E. And so A would go to our hard drives paging file, and E would come in to our RAM. So it's uh, more accessible. But if we wanted to use program A again, it would have to swap it out for something else to be able to use it. And so all that swapping is going to wear your hard drive out over time. And it's just going to make it slower. Uh, if you open up more programs, you know, you can, it'll crash the system, and we don't want that. So if you notice that, it might be time to upgrade your RAM. Questions? Did that answer it good enough for you, Janina? Yes, Justin. Hey, um, I'm not trying to jump ahead or anything here, but just yeah. a quick question, right? When when you use a virtual machine, right, is that using the virtual memory on the PC or is it still using the the RAM portion of it? Um, so it it is using RAM, but you allocate some of your RAM for that virtual machine. So if I have uh like 32, if I have 32, 32 gigs of RAM on my system uh, and I wanted to run a virtual machine, I would allocate some of that RAM from this 32. So if I wanted to use, I don't know, 10 gigs for my virtual machine, this RAM, would be what the virtual machine uses. And if I use my regular machine, like if I'm running a virtual machine on my desktop and I wanted to use my regular desktop, I'd only have access to 22. That makes sense frame. now. That, that's why I ask you when you're setting it up, it do ask you like how many gigs you want yeah. to it. Okay. Exactly. Now. And right. so long as that instance is running, that RAM is tied up. Until you turn it off. Uh, okay. Thanks for clearing that up. Mm -hmm. But if you close that virtual machine, then it'll free up that RAM again and you'll have access to your 32. Yeah. You don't have to delete it. You just have to like turn it off, close it out, and it'll automatically free up that memory. Yeah. So if you're using lots of virtual machines on your desktop, you're going to want more RAM. So that's when you would want those higher RAM counts for sure, because you're going to be allocating space to it clear not jumping too far ahead we'll be getting into that soon when we start talking about hypervisors and stuff yeah all right what to consider when upgrading or replacing so how much ram do i need and how much is allowed by the operating system how many and what kind of memory modules are currently installed on my motherboard? How many and what kind of modules can I fit on my motherboard? How do I select and purchase the right modules for my upgrade? And how do I physically install the new modules? So we'll be answering those questions throughout the rest of this presentation, but you know, you can be limited to what, how much RAM you're allowed to have based off of your operating system. But assuming you're not, you're never really going to need more than 32. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, you are very rarely ever going to need more than 32. <laughs> you... <laughs> Under current iterations of systems, yes, yeah. it would be rare. So let's move forward and answer some of these questions. So how much memory do I need? So with the demands today's software places on memory, the answer is probably all you can get is what this quote says. But Mr. Ashley, Mr. Avery says, you're probably not ever going to need more than 32. Um, but opera operation system or OS limitations are going to be 
for a Windows 8 and Windows 7 system, you're going to need at least two gigabyte bits. Uh, you were right but, the first time it was bytes. Yeah, bytes. Ah. Big B bytes, little B bits. Yep. Need to, you need at least two gigabytes, but more is obviously better. Um, the limit for a 32-bit operating system is going to be four gigabytes installed RAM. So if you have Windows 7 32-bit, then if you put an eight gigabyte uh, module of RAM, it will only make use of four gigabytes. You will have wasted the other four. It will not be able to access it. But a 64-bit Windows installation can handle a lot more. So the 64-bit installation of Windows 8 can use up to 128 gigabits, gigabytes of RAM. And Windows 7 Home Premium 64 can use up to 16. I think so, Windows 10 is north of 1,000. Yeah, you you never need that much RAM. That's that's crazy amounts of RAM. <laughs> 128 is a crazy amount of RAM. So I'm one. I'm running 85 simultaneous hypervisors. Yeah, if you're if you're running that many, sure. Time to climb. Ba, ba, ba. We're going to stop sharing and then reshare. That should tell you that should tell you automatically that the the problems with your RAM because you only touch the RAM. So logically, you know, that's the only thing that can really be wrong. Right. Warning signs and troubleshooting. So a warning sign and symptoms, you could get a blue screen of death or BSOD that could appear. Uh, the system works fine when first starting, but it begins to have problems later. Uh, it freezes, hesitating, or system moving slowly, or the system does not boot, boot at all and beeps are heard instead. So those are signs that uh, your, something's wrong with your RAM, and that's what you should focus on first. Questions on that? All right. So some more uh, on warning signs and troubleshooting. Some solutions to try before replacing your RAM. You should reboot the system to clear the RAM memory. So it could be that you just have too many programs open. If you're Marvin King, you might have a lot of windows open in your browser. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, over, over under 20 tabs right now, Kelly. What do you think? Over under. Considering you're probably doing both at the same time, I'm guessing over. Oh, it's well over. Yeah, I think I got over. 20 tabs on one actual browser and i have a couple <laughs> browsers right now so awful on how many pcs uh no it's all coming off this one but okay well i, knew, I know you got like 30 at the house oh i do have but the fact that i hooked up that second monitor now i got more room for more tabs man hey like, more real estate <laughs> yeah so try closing out your tabs and your programs that might help too but if you restart your system That'll clear the RAM memory. Uh, enter into BIOS and set post to disable abbreviated start to check for memory issues. You can check your memory in another system. So you could take your RAM out of one and put it in the other. And if it runs fine, then the RAM's probably OK. Uh, check for overheating. So if you have dusty vents or fans aren't working, it's very possible that your system's overheating and it's a it's an airflow issue and not a RAM issue. You should test the power supply for failing, overloaded or overheating. 
I have only ever had issues with the computers that I've built twice in my life. One time we thought it was because of the RAM and other time we thought it was because of a faulty hard drive. Both times it was due to a power supply failing. So uh, that this is very much a good tip. If you're trying everything and it's just not working, it's possible your power supply is failing. Uh, it's either not providing enough uh, output over time or it's not connected properly. My first power supply that I bought, you you had to force the the plug into the power supply with a lot of force, like way way more force than you should ever put on anything, and that fixed it. But the second time I had a power supply issue, it was a brand new power supply, and I didn't think that would be the issue because it was brand new. Uh, but it, it turns out that was in fact the issue. And uh, I was able to make use of the warranty and they sent me a new one. But we'll get into power supplies more at a different time. And then finally, we should test using software, website troubleshooting or a Windows utility program to be sure it is a memory issue. Anything you would like to add, Kelly? Not currently. OK. So Any far. questions? All right. Oof. That's a lot of text. So 